starts with Socrates and Sextus Empiricus, and that's a long time ago. Um, and what they meant by skepticism was very different than what we mean by skepticism. They meant that you can't know anything. Um, you can't know that the universe exists. You can't trust your senses because our senses lie and we're on uh, these little creatures on a planet. We're not set up to know everything. Um, the thing is that agnosticism, which was made up by Huxley at the turn of the 20th century, was based on a very narrow version of skepticism. Instead of that you can't know anything about the universe, just pointing that skepticism at certain things for which we have no evidence. Uh, specifically, mostly the God idea, but also all sorts of things that we have no evidence for that, we, that people continue to believe in. That this idea that you can't, you can't prove a negative, you can't know a negative. But that's really not the case. While, while um, it's philosophically sound to say that we can't know anything, it is not philosophically sound to say that you can know some things but that certain types of things that you want to believe in but you don't have any evidence for, those things you're gonna say you can't know anything about. If I have a plate of chicken in front of me, I can't say I can't know whether or not it's steak. I can know. I know certain things, they're evident in front of me. And the things that we have evidence and proof for or the things that after a long look at we have no evidence or proof at, we can begin to say that we know. One doesn't have to be agnostic about everything. So while we are skeptics, um, we're trying to elicit skepticism in other people, but it's certainly possible for us to know that some things are not the case. Um, I've got time for only a couple of examples, but my books, uh, Doubt, The Happiness Myth, and The End of the Soul, all are chock full of examples of people who had uh, who were skeptics all through history. It's remarkable how long it goes back. The ancient Karvaka in India went, were in 600 BC and they didn't believe that we could know anything. And they were skeptical uh, certainly of astrology, of an afterlife. Um, the, the, one of the examples that I wanna talk about today is, is Thomas Edison. Um, he was a known skeptic and doubter of all sorts of things. And William James, the very famous Harvard philosopher, had been one of the people who was uh, involved in scientific, scientific study of the afterlife. Seances were very big in this period. Um, and they were very big even in scientific circles. People had just found out about radioactivity and about the periodic table, and there were a lot of things that were so new that people thought, well, maybe this very foreign subject is also gonna be something that turns out to be true. And um, World War I certainly had so many deaths in it that it, it encouraged a lot of people to want very much to have this communication with the dead. And these things were mostly about seances, small groups of people meeting, not the arena kind of uh, um, talking to the dead that we have today. But um, they were amazingly peopled by scientific minds. Marie Curie and her husband went to them. Um, Charles Richet, who was a Nobel Prize winning scientist, is the one who made up ectoplasm. Um, I'm sorry, my slide for that isn't here, but it's the goo that mediums would produce on themselves and on others in order to, to have a apparent proof that something had happened. Um, and you can see this in Ghostbusters, they get slimed. Um, this was, the mediums were mostly from Italy and Spain and they came up into France and England and tricked a lot of people with a lot of flim flam, flam. So when William James was one of the believers in the scientific study of the afterlife, he was not uh, an outlier on this. And he promised very publicly that when he died, he would do his best to come back and contact somebody. So. A little while after he died, uh, one of his secretaries announced that she had been contacted by William James. And, and it made a huge splash. A lot of newspapers covered it, and the New York Times covered it. And they decided to dispatch a reporter to Thomas Edison, a well-known skeptic, to see if he, they could find out what he thought of it. And I'll, uh, 
I'll read you a little quote. This is 1910 in the New York Times, which is pretty bold. No, this is Edison. No, all this talk of an existence for us as individuals beyond the grave is wrong. It is born of our tenacity of life, our desire to go on living, our dread of coming to an end as individuals. I do not dread it, though. Personally, I cannot see any use of a future life. In a later communique, he wrote, I have never seen the slightest scientific proof of the religious theories of heaven and hell, of future life for individuals, or of a, proof, or of, of a personal God. I work on certain lines that might be called, perhaps, mechanical. Proof, proof. That is what I have always been after. Um, he got in a lot of trouble, uh, a lot of, <laughs> lot of letters. Um, but there were many other debunkers. Uh, around the time, same time, but starting earlier um, in France, there was a group called the Society of Mutual Autopsy. Um, I went to France to study them. And, uh, down in the, right under the Eiffel Tower, there's the Trocadero the, in the Musée de l'Homme, the Museum of Mankind um, is there. And down these long winding steps uh, in the dark with a little flashlight, I found these uh, old metal cabinets. And in them was the archives of the Society of Mutual Autopsy. These were people who had met as atheists before they became, they started the Society of Mutual Autopsy. And they were, um, well, as Phil Plate would say, they were dicks about it. Um, <laughs> they were brashly offensive whenever they got the chance. They, um, they were brashly offensive in a, the process of com campaigning the government to kick out the uh, nuns from a municipal building, which they actually succeeded in doing. They changed street signs that were religious to, from like Saint-Étienne to D Rue Diderot. Um, Diderot being a famous Enlightenment atheist or close to. Um, they fought against seances as well, against a whole range of uh, superstitious ideas. What they meant by the Society of Mutual Autopsy was this. They were, um, they were inspired by Broca's aphasia. I had a great slide about that too. Um, Broca's aphasia is uh, on the third left frontal uh, convolution of the brain. If you have a lesion there, you'll have trouble speaking. So it was the first time anyone had ever proved a relationship between brain morphology and personality. Brain shape, weight, size, and personality abilities and traits. So the Society of Mutual Autopsy, Broca was one of the people who joined the earliest, and he was also one of the earliest brains dissected. Um, they waited till after death. <laughs> but a lot of these were older people who had joined. Um, they were also inspired, along with Broca, they were inspired by the French translation of uh, The Origin of the Species, which came a little late um, and was done by a woman named Clémence Royer who had been a longtime atheist and a longtime believer in evolution, Lamarckian evolution. And she wrote a preface to The Origin of the Species that was, it was so thick, it was a book of, of its own, arguing that the origin of the species proved atheism. And the French got the origin of the species that way through her. Darwin actually repudiated that translation about 10 years later, but that was all they had for a long time. So inspired by both these people, they decided to start the Society of Mutual Autopsy and they advertised in it in all the left wing leaning journals and hundreds of people all over France and some around the world joined the Society of Mutual Autopsy and they sent in their, their uh, life stories because you had to be able to make a relationship between the abilities and the personality. The original people who had founded it knew each other very well so they could dissect a brain and they made pronouncements. They said this area was thick and after all this person had great spatial relations so maybe this has something to do with. The truth is they didn't find anything uh, anywhere near as concrete as Broca's aphasia in the 30 years that they practiced this. Um, they were also, when they were doing this, making a statement about their belief in, in there being no afterlife and they, um, they did that partially through making fun of seances, um, but partially just by uh, 
They had materialist deathbed scenes. At the time, in France, there were published an awful lot of uh, Catholic death deathbed scenes where the person would announce that they were giving themselves up to God and they would reiterate their faith. And so they had these materialist deathbed scenes where they would talk about proof and science and how in dying and giving their brains to dissection, they were, they were forwarding science and therefore living on. The, um, and Clemence Royer, by the way, the translator, she, she joined, she was one of, the, one of them. There were men and women from all over France um, who were part of the Society of Mutual Autopsy. Um, The reason they thought that this would prove to the Catholic Church that there was no soul was because at the time, the definition of soul was really the thinking part of you. Um, the whole idea was that, you, that the, the meat was just a, uh, the seat of the brain, and the brain, the, the mind, was the soul. And so nowadays, that's just not what soul means anymore. They just keep swerving to fit the evidence a little bit. Um, but that's what it meant at the time, and so the idea was that to prove that there was a relationship there between what the brain looked like and what the brain could, what the mind could do, would be a way of proving this. And in a way, they won. Um, that is how it, it didn't get rid of the idea of the soul, but it, it, it entirely changed what it was and made it much less powerful an explanation of what was going on with human beings. Um, the actions that they took part in had a poetic side to them. There was poetry that they wrote also. There were poets amongst them as well as many doctors and other kinds of scientists. Um, but also just the whole way they carried out their business in terms of ritualizing science a little bit and making, um, well, like those materialist deathbed scenes, making there be a kind of way of marveling at the universe as well as describing it. So it's not just a matter of science, but a matter of being aware of the wonders of science. And I think in the terms of the future of secularism, um, we might do even more in our blogs and articles to not just have all with science, but to have all with the things that are beyond science, but still scientific. Um, by that I mean something like uh, the sheer billions billions of galaxies out there. We're incredibly small, and then of course the billions of human beings that are um, on the planet. If you had billions of ping pong balls on a table and one fell off, it wouldn't matter. But each of us matters tremendously. Um, it's a paradox. It's something that thinking about makes us more human. And I think some of the people who believe in strange things that are flim-flam do so because they're hungry for something that reflects the inner life. But there are things that are not flim-flam that reflect the inner life that we can talk about and can think about. Um, another of the paradoxes is just the simple fact that we're all in our heads right now, in our skulls, looking out at each other. I mean, it's an amazing thing. The meat thinks. The meat wrote Paradise Lost. The meat wrote all the symphonies. The meat made the iPad. It's, it's shocking, and it's something that you can never fully take in, and it makes sense to run over it in your mind. The, you know, the church had some things right that you go back once a week. These are things that you contemplate more and more, and you get more and more um, out of them. Meditating on the wonders and paradoxes. Um, Another way that we could take care of ourselves is something that I talk about in the happiness myth. Um, what I've been talking about so far, a lot of it is in doubt. Um, but in the happiness myth, I, I look at the way we, for instance, the way we eat, the way we take drugs today, um, the way we uh, think about sex, the way we think about a whole range of uh, things, including exercise. Um, the, the notion that we have about exercise today is uh, very skewed in history. The only time in history that you can find people being as concentrated in the body beautiful as we are is the ancient Spartans that had a, they had a population of slaves larger than the members of the community. 
um, and the fascists, uh, the next one. And there was also a in plantation culture in, in the South. Um, there had been tournaments that were also about the body beautiful. We're in terrible company with this. Um, not just health, but, but the, the body beautiful to the point of the gym body. And if you think about gyms, how, what a strange thing they are. Look, if you, look, if you were in some other culture and you looked at this, or if this was in another, if we looked at another culture that was so interested in the body beautiful, we would say this was a martial culture. This was a culture that was trying to promote a kind of strength and militarism. Um, but also, an, it reiterates the idea of having an underclass. We let someone else rake our leaves and we go to the gym. We take the escalator to the Stairmaster. And there's a reason that we do it. It's the underclass that goes home in dirty clothes. We go home from work in dirty clothes and then switch to a gym bag that has, that's where we sweat. It's a way of saying to the culture who we are. And so, if you like gyms, go to the gym. And of course, there are health benefits to a certain amount of exercise. But the idea of cleaning one's own house, taking walks when you had to go, go places, raking your own leaves, the idea that the gym is a very peculiar place. Um, it might be another kind of thing that, uh, along with the other things that I talk about in the happiness myth, another kind of broad range things that we could be skeptical about. It's not just the flim flam, but also just our own culture's biases and the things that we think are true. Um, there's one more thing that I'll mention about ways that we could take care of ourselves um, in terms of skepticism, and that is um, the new book I'm writing is called Stay, and it's about uh, the history and the, a history of suicide and the philosophy against it, and it's very much a secular book. Um, the religious people have their own answers for this. Uh, God says don't do it, um, and of course a lot of religious people do it anyway, thinking God will forgive. Um, so even they need a secular argument against suicide. And there, is, there have been throughout history uh, philosophers who have come up with beautiful arguments that in one way we owe it to each other to stay alive, that human beings copy each other. We have tremendous influence on each other. And suicide clusters show us that. The, the idea of staying alive for each other is a sort of strange one, and it seems in some ways taxing to the person. And I'm not talking about euthanasia at the end of life. That to me seems like man disease management. That's a different thing. But despair suicide. We have a, a kind of live and let die attitude in the secular community about it. And I think it's a wrong turn that we took because religion was so adamantly against it to the point of punishing corpses um, and, and taking away the estate of the suicide. Um, so the secular community, before the Enlightenment, but then very much with the Enlightenment, Hume and uh, the Baron Dolbach both wrote uh, what you could actually say are almost pro-suicide tracts that were very much against the church, but in no way looking at the situation in terms of humanism. Um, but what I was saying was that while it seems almost cruel to say to a person who's in that much despair, you have to stay, the truth is, as soon as you start to think about things that way, the community becomes a warmer place. You realize that staying alive, even, even sitting on your bed and crying or thinking about crying, and you don't even have the energy to cry, even that is a gift to the community. If you want your niece to stay alive through the dark times, you have to. And it becomes, the community becomes a richer place, a place that you have more of a connection to. And so, I think the one thing that we're missing is gratitude. And so I'll say it here, thank you for staying. Thank you for staying alive to anybody out there who's ever, who's ever thought about it. That's one of the things I want the book to do, to express gratitude and to recognize that it's a gift to the community. And it's, it's a tremendous contribution um, by someone who thinks that they can make no contributions because they're at the end of their, at the end of their rope. Um, I think I'm gonna, stop there and just say that these, um, looking at history, we can see a whole range from the ancient times to, to, to now. I mean, when I was writing Doubt, I thought I was just gonna be seeing people who said no, no, no to religion and to superstition. 
And instead, I found people making suggestions about how we should live in that situation. Um, and that's what I think the future of skepticism needs to have. We need to know our history. And knowing our history will enrich who we are today and who we can be. Um, thank you. Jennifer Michael Hecht. Jennifer Michael Hecht.